<laughs> it's all good, man. <laughs> that is you I was like, I, I was like, eh, you know, I, you probably thought about it more than I did. You know, <laughs> like just. It was poetic justice at its finest, man. That's how you turn a hater into a believer. A grown man crying. Oh, he was crying <laughs> like a b What up, this is Yellow Wolf, and you are now watching Hip Hop DX. Yellow Wolf has been in the game for almost 15 years, dropping close to 20 projects, including collaborative work with Ed Sheeran, Travis Barker, DJ Paul, Shady Records, and more. He made it from the trunk of his Chevy in Alabama to stadiums worldwide. He has managed to evolve while also remaining true to himself and sharing his journey with his audience throughout the whole time. Yellow Wolf, welcome to the Hip Hop DX offices in Hollywood. How are you doing? Thank you. That was a flattering intro. I have to let the people know. <laughs> That's what's up. Damn, 15 years. It's been that long. I'm counting like the, the first projects. First, just that were like the seed. Yeah, man. Um, my, yeah, didn't become an actual professional until um, my freshman project with Marshall and Interscope. So other than that, yeah, it's completely out of the trunk. Half, half in the trunk, half in the ditch with a nine to five. Well, I remember you, you said in an interview once that you didn't, you stayed away from computers. You didn't even have internet a lot of the time back home. Like at what point did you start to realize that you could actually blow up online? I had a Blackberry. I had a Blackberry and I was taking black and white photos of my neighborhood. Obviously before Instagram, I was feeding Twitter every tweet. I would tweet with a photo and a story with that photo. And I started to see the, the reaction and the understanding of what I was, the juxtaposition I was talking about, you know, namely through a dude named um, Dax out of Atlanta who was doing a blog called Snort This at the time. And he hit me up. He's like, man, I want you to be a reporter for me. You're doing some ill shit. And, and Dax is... And, you know, like a very like integral part of the Atlanta hip hop scene, you know, all the way from Outkast, very beginning. And he's a world renowned street artist. And that's when I was like, oh shit, someone that dope's paying attention. It was then, and then finally, I think someone called me and was like, hey man. Pitchfork gave you a really good review on Trump music. And I was like, who the fuck is Pitchfork? <laughs> and who cares? You know what I mean? Um, and then they told me who they were and what it meant to the culture. And then it was Fader knocking on the door for the cover. And then I was like, oh, okay, this, this social media thing is, is serious. But it wasn't until we went and nailed the coffin and at South by Southwest. Yeah. I got nine shows out here at South by Southwest. Um, this is my first trip out here, so it's my first taste. There was one writer early on by the name of Maurice Garland that gave me the absolute best interview that I could have ever asked for. And it was that interview, I think, that solidified, well, at least for those who chose to pay attention, it solidified my story. Because he was, um, he was a fan, but he asked me challenging questions about the culture and about my place in it and why I, why I felt like I deserved to yeah. be a part of this. And, you know, just really challenging interview. And the interview was the best interview for hip hop at that time. For myself, uh, I felt like it was just the perfect situation, the perfect platform mm -hmm. and, and, Mar and Maurice was a very respected and uh, uh, sought out interviewer at the time you know and um, so that spawned a lot of great yeah. interviews and a lot of uh, with a lot of respected uh, bloggers and publications. Well, we're hoping we can come in second place potentially um, but I want to take you back you mentioned Atlanta I know that you said you needed to leave home in order to really realize your dreams. And you mentioned in an interview that Atlanta had a special part in making that all happen. Was it that moment or was there something else that happened in Atlanta that really took things to the next level for you? Um, 
when I, I lived in a trailer park literally in Huntsville, Alabama. And it was 05, 06, and it just kept hitting a wall where I was at. And I felt like what I was, what I was talking about, it was going to take someone more traveled to understand the dichotomy of, of all right, I'm, I'm walking out on stage head to toe in mossy oak. I got a dude in a six foot deer costume. I got another homie of mine in mossy oak head to toe with all gold permanent teeth throwing lures at people. But there's Wu-Tang, there's NWA, there's Beastie Boys, there's Pantera, there's these, there's this country rock hip hop dichotomy and that had to, someone, someone traveled would have to, it would have to be someone traveled to understand what I was yeah. doing. And so we actually sought out Kawan Prather because we knew he signed Outkast. And as creative as Outkast was as a unit and as funky as Atlanta was, Kawan Prather I knew, or we knew, we crossed our fingers at least that would understand it. So we made our way to Kawan, and I signed to Ghetto Vision, a production deal, and got to work. And it was years later before we could lock down a deal. And um, so we started doing shows at Lenny's Bar, uh, Drunken Unicorn, locally in Atlanta. And we were carrying, as openers, B.O.B., Big Crit, um, Ritz, Rest in Peace, Grip Plies. This was our unit. This was our crew of, of MCs that were traveling around Atlanta doing shows. What were those tours like? Or those shows like? Dude, like Janelle Monet coming in with in in a three piece suit with her crew with sixty or seventy of our friends stuffed in a sweaty room drinking warm PBRs and putting on a show, you know? Like the Drunken Unicorn and MJQ was a hub for new ideas and artists to come break. And then it was Lenny's Bar, which is now closed. And then it was Smith's Old Bar. And um, yeah, I went on to create a project assigned to Kawan Prather called Arena Rap with Malay. And with Arena Rap, we built a band and we started touring and the fans just started to multiply, man, but we could never get a deal for it, so. You manifested it with wanting to be in arenas one day from the, the small bars. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had a vision. We had a vision for, with Arena Rap, but you know, we hit a crossroads. We, we did this one show, I remember, and there was about, 1,500 to 2,000 kids. I don't, it was a sold out show. Fantasia from American Idol jumped on stage <laughs> and started twerking. Fantasia was twerking at your show? On stage. <laughs> I had hair down to my waist. Lil Wayne was there. DJ Khaled was there. In the LA, audience? They were sitting side stage watching. L.A. Reid was there. I mean, the show was just crazy. You know, it was just dumped. And... After the gig, um, the word I got back was everybody thought it was dope, but they didn't know what to do with it. They were like, this is cool, but, you know, what the fuck is this? You know, I had a black fiddle player, um, a, ba a banjo player with a mohawk, <laughs> a drummer, a DJ. You know, I'm in duck boots with long hair and a flannel shirt. And rapping over uh, Jose Gonzalez samples, you know. So at what moment did uh, L.A. Reid think that something was clicking? Because I remember you talking about in the story where, you know, he invited you up to the office. Well, it was that point. At that point, it was like L.A. wasn't going. He wasn't going. And L.A. was Kawan's person. L.A. was Kawan's guy, you know. Yeah. He worked for L.A. And Kawan was like, look, man, 
you know, just go do a rap project. And if we can't get you a deal in six months, you could walk. And we're sitting in the studio, Malay and I, and Kawan, and Jade I, and Bear, my managers. And Malay said, oh, rap, rap project? You want to do a fucking rap project? Because after we had built this thing up with Arena Rap, you know, Malay yeah. took his big publishing check, bought a trailer, paid for all the equipment for the band, put all his creativity, all, all his, his mastermind, really, along with me to put together this Arena Rap project. And we knew we had something special. We knew. Even though everybody else didn't get it at the time, we knew we had something special. And he was right. We were both right. But I had to do what I had to do at the time. I was like, listen, man, I'm going to go do this rap project and, you know, I'm going to see what Kawan can do. And he said, he stood up, he goes, all right. And he picked up this $10,000 Nico keyboard, <laughs> a fucking, one of those keyboards Timberland made. Yeah. And he fucking slams it on the ground and he stomps on it. And he goes, you go do that Asheroff bullshit. You go do that Asheroff bullshit if you want to. Fucking white rappers. And he fucking walked out of the door. He said, I'm going to L.A. <coughs> he said, I'm going to L.A. Fuck y'all. And he went to L.A. and produced Frank Ocean's Grammy Award winning album. <laughs> oh, but yeah. He, is, he, he, they were, he was the one who wrote all those songs with Frank for Chad Orange. He did it. <laughs> <laughs> But I went, I, I was like, fuck it. And then I went and got a deal with Eminem. So it worked out for both of you. That yeah, is insane. Yeah. So, so have you talked since that? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, all the time, all the time. <laughs> it's funny because after we did the freshman, uh, freshman project radioactive, which had a lot of fucking like unnecessary outside influence outside of Marshall and I, I mean, it was like, Oh, Marshall signed a white boy. Everybody wanted a fucking piece of that project. Every yeah. Producers were coming out of the fucking woodworks. Writers were coming out of the fucking woodworks. And all these songs were being pitched to me and Marshall. And, you know, as a freshman rookie artist signed to Shady, you know, I, I was going. I was going for it. And I didn't want to disappoint, you know. And I was afraid to say no in a lot of situations. And some of the records on Radioactive, we still perform to this day. And some of them are just like pff, cringeworthy. You know, I'm just like, I just a, a piece of a piece of my career that I learned from a lot, you know, which I'm thankful for. Um, so coming into my uh, sophomore album, which was Love Story, I was like, you know what? I'm bringing Malay back into mm. this situation. So... Malay and I, knowing that the world hadn't heard these songs, we took four of the songs from the, ra from the arena rap sessions that were six years before Trump music was even conceptualized and put them on Love Story. And, and they, they, they worked. That's wild. They worked. So we, we, we knew yeah. we were right and we were. And the only song that we did... Four of those songs were like eight years old when they made it to Love Story. Now, they're like 16 years old. Um, Have a Great Flight, Empty Bottles, Disappear. Disappear was the first record I had ever recorded with Malay, period. That was the day we walked in. The day we met, we recorded Disappear. So those were all written and, <clears throat> and produced and basically finished at the time of 16 the years ago. Wow. Um, and, uh, and the only song that we did was at the tail end of the Love Story sessions, he wrote uh, American You on guitar. And everybody went crazy yeah. for it, you know. And Marshall was like, oh, this is it, this is it, this is the one, man. And at first they didn't have a rap verse, and then we ended up adding 16, 16, the 16 bar rap verse, which is Marshall's genius. Because I wasn't gonna, I didn't want to put a rapper really? on it. Yeah, I was like, nah. What was his conversation? Like, what does he, what does he say to you to, to be like, Yo, no, you need to have one. He on. says, dude, I'm Eminem. <laughs> 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 At that point, you can't say much back. <laughs> nah, man. Like, it, there's actually, you know, we've 
we got into plenty, uh, plenty creative discussions where, you know, I disagreed. And there's plenty of situations that I absolutely agreed. Mm. What was the biggest, what was one of the biggest disagreements you guys had creatively that, um, you know, went one way or another? Uh, it was, um, it was less role for sure with, uh, Kid Rock, you know, just classic long conversations, you know, like, why was it such a big disagreement? Um, just mixing and how to, you know, just being creative with Bob and how to get Bob to sing the <laughs> word this certain way because Bob ain't got a southern accent like I do. And, whoo, man, <laughs> you know, it's, it, was, it was really, really difficult. It's really difficult to have a conversation with, you know, an icon, man. You know, I'm yeah. a fan still, so it's... It's hard to like step back out of being a fan and saying, you know, I really need to make a decision for Yellow Wolf right now. You know? Like that's yeah. most important right now. But that was the blessing of the records of Radioactive that didn't work, that I called. Because you got to say, look. I called it. I was like, yo, man, this, is, this isn't going to, this isn't going to fly. And it wasn't with Marshall in particular, you know, it was with, there was a whole yeah. team of people. I mean, <laughs> just a whole, whole team of people. But it gave me leverage to say no, you know, because the la yeah. last time it didn't work. Um, you wouldn't believe the suggestions. They, they wanted to put, they wanted Ed Sheeran on Love Story. The, the label wanted Ed Sheeran to sing the American You Hook. I was like, dude, it's American yeah. you. He's, He's from literally <laughs> from the UK. Nah, man, you did that EP with him. He owes you that favor. I was like, he owe me another favor. He is not singing American you. You're saying how it's hard to have a discussion with an icon because you're a fan yourself. Um, do you remember the first song you heard that blew you away by Eminem? You were like, who the fuck is this guy? Um, the first time... I heard Marshall was on a ruckus mixtape. This is back when 411 uh, skate videos were, was, was where I was getting a lot of underground hip hop. There was a, f a flood of hip hop coming through. Uh, Fat Beats was flooding mixtapes out of New York. Swab House was flooding mixtapes out of Texas. Atlanta was flooding mixtapes through uh, Earwax. Wax and Facts was another plug to get mixtapes. And somewhere through there, I heard Marshall and I was like, is that a white boy? <laughs> that sounds like a white boy. Like, you know, I, I just, well, it, it wasn't just the accent and the style, it was the content. I was like, the mushrooms, yeah. the, you know, the trippy, the white boy shit. And then, yeah, I just started digging, digging through and um, trying just to try to find more, you was know. Was it Any Man? Huh? Was it that song? Any Man That Jump In Front Of A Minivan? Any Man That Could Jump In Front Of A Minivan With 20 Grand, A Bottle Of Pain Pills, And Some Mini Things <laughs> Is Fucking Crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was um, wild. Yeah. And then it was, uh, Don't You Want To Grow Up To Be Just Like Me? Yeah. That was it for me. I was like, oh, this dude's nuts. You know, just that's perfect. And I was so happy, you know, like, yes, we got yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> we got one, an ally. I always thought Marshall would be an ally, whereas, like, and I hate most white rappers. Like, I just. We know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just not like. And it's just a bit, I, I think it's because I come from a school of show and prove, like LP from Def Jux. You know what I mean? That was a white boy. I was like, Jesus, dude, like this guy is the illest, you know? You gotta be that ill or you're not mm -hmm. at all. And- um, So you didn't like that Asher Roth shit? <laughs> nah, I didn't like it. I didn't like Asher Roth shit, you know? Not, not hating on Asher's style or, 
it, I just, I thought he sounded too much like Marshall. Period. Yeah. You know, and that, that's another thing, like biting, like no biting, no, no biting. I, that's the era I'm from and I don't think that will ever die. You know, and that goes for any kind of art or any genre of music. It's not just hip hop. If I hear something and I've already become attached to another artist as a fan, and I can't get away from that artist that I fell in love with every time I listen to you, mm. I can't really become attached to what you do. So it was a little bit uh, non-coincidental that all of the people dissed on Bloody Sunday were white rappers? <laughs> Man, I tried, to get it, I, I tried to get it cracking on Bloody Sunday for the sake of sport. You know, I was like, First of all, no one I dissed on Bloody Sunday I don't respect. Like, all those guys are talented, all of them. And which is why I went, which is why I did it. You know, I'm, I'm not shooting a deer in a cage. You know, that's no fun. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted, I expected bars out of G-Eazy, to be honest. You know, I expected if anyone was gonna come, I thought G-Eazy was gonna come, but. You didn't expect bars out of Post Malone, though, did you? Actually, I was hoping. <laughs> I mean, his Wikipedia says hip hop. <laughs> you know, he did win best rap album at the AMAs. <laughs> and uh, you know, like, dude's fucking a G, man. He he kills it. You know, I respect all them guys. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't even go there if I didn't. But, uh, you know, it was fun. It was, it lasted. It was like a fucking yeah. in and out, you know? Um, but, hell, I don't know. Well, I have to stick on, on beef for one more question. Uh, in Rap Devil, uh, MGK says, don't take my verse off of Yellow Wolf's album. The inside of that is M MGK early on had made a comment, you know, Young, super hot-headed, he's the homie, you know, yeah, so yeah. whatever. But young, hot-headed, made a comment about Warp Tour or whatever. I was on Warp Tour, I took it personally. He was like, you know, nobody needs to be doing this or that, throwing water, starting mosh pits, that's my shit. And I was on Warp Tour throwing water and starting <laughs> mosh pits. I was like, who the fuck are you talking about, me? You know? So it started a thing, and our fans actually took it way further than we did, you know? And so I just let that ride for a while and, you know, just let it live. You know, he ended up being label partners, you know, so and I just I just kept kept rocking. And eventually he came to Nashville, Tennessee, and he had a record with my boy, Jim Johnson. And Jim Johnson is a longtime friend of mine. You guys worked really close. Together. Yeah. I mean, a long time, long time friend of mine. And my boy, Alan Zilla, was like, yo, man, let's go to this MGK show tonight, man. Fuck it. Let's just go. So we went. Hung out, dapped it up, hung out, you know, listened to some music, exchanged numbers, started talking. And um, a record came around the table for Trump music that I thought would be perfect for him. Um, and I can't take all the credit because DJ Paul hit me and was like, we kind of just had the same thought at the same time. He's like, listen, man, put MGK and Eminem on this record and let's fucking go. And I was like, Marshall will never go for that, man. I was like, I'll hit him up. So I, I, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm in, I'm in. So I laid my verse, sent it to MGK, got MGK's verse back to me, and I sent that to Marshall. Crickets, I didn't hear nothing. I took that as he didn't wanna do it, he wasn't into it, and then some months later, boom. He drops this disc record on MGK. And um, Kamikaze, no one knew was coming. I didn't know he had a record in the bag. I didn't know he was even working on an album. So when it dropped, I had this song in my pocket. I already had. Oh. So, so MGK had it also to say, well, <laughs> since we're going through this, don't do that. <laughs> I put it out. And oh, that's well, I, well, Truth be told, uh, loyalty, I, I just, I called Marshall and I was like, yo man, like, I got a record with homie and I really, really like it. DJ Paul <laughs> produced it. <laughs> DJ Paul produced it. 
And man, I just, he was like, man, fuck it, dude, run it. People need to hear that, you know? People, people want to hear that. I mean, he was, Marshall's always been selfless with me and what I do, always. I can say that, like, he's always been a champion for me to, like, if it works for me, man, he's, he's behind yeah. it. You know, like, he's not a hater, man. He's just, that was his, that was his deal, and he'll hold it down on his own. Because you weren't expecting I was to be sitting there, if I was fucking, my phone blew up. Like, what do you mean? Like, I heard it probably fucking 0. 0.2 seconds after it hit the internet. Like, my, my phone's blowing up. I got links back to back from everybody. So I heard it immediately. Of course, you know, everybody's saying, he shouted you out, shouted you out, shouted you out. And I thought it was a G move, honestly. It kind of put... It was kind of like, well, <laughs> what are we going to do now? <laughs> you have to now. Yeah, now I got to put this out. And did you feel um, like you could take a side or no when, when that book came out? No, it wasn't. I, there wasn't going to be a side to be taken. And if there was, obviously, I'm right with Shady. You know, if, I, if, if it meant that we had to go to war or something like that, and Marshall was like, Do I need you for, for this, then Kurt was. As far as like lyrically, which song was better? Oh, well, I mean, what, which, who's got better bars? No, yeah. like, like overall, like it doesn't have to be specifically bar for bar, but just like an overall, which was a better district. I mean, Marshall is, he's a ro he's some sort of, he's psycho. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, <laughs> I've, been, I've been around Marshall like overseas and, um. Just walk in, I walked into the dressing room and he was just spilling this two minute rant on one of the lines was, I put Dakota's carcass in Yoda's starship. <laughs> <laughs> and that and every other syllable and every other word rhymed exactly with that. I put Dakota's carcass in Yoda's starship and whatever the fuck the else he was saying. It. And Paul, Paul sitting there filming, pans the camera to me. I'm like, the fuck you want me to say? I ain't, I ain't getting in this shit. But just, I've seen him sit there and stack rhymes and memorize. And he, he's just, lyrically, it's just some, there's something wrong with that guy. <laughs> there's something wrong with him. So on that side, there's that. But for MGK, man, like, wow. <laughs> that was really impressive. Yeah. You know what I mean? First of all, the speed of the comeback to the, he was very convinced and stood his ground. And I thought that that was respectable and like, and some G shit. I think everybody thought that, you know? Yeah. You'd be a hater to say, ah, dude didn't yeah. hold it down for himself, because he did. And um, I commend him for it, because it's, you know, Marshall's no easy task well on that note um you know he's such like you're saying eminem is such a, a freak when it comes to rhyming but you impressed him early on did he let you know what the verse or the bar was that he remembered from when he first listened to you when he signed you oh i mean when i showed up the first time i met him you know with them a few conversations he started talking about pop the trunk and he recited the whole thing like better than I did <laughs> I was, it was I was stunned man you know like this isn't happening to me like this isn't this is not real man you know what I mean I mean I had just fucking I I, I flew coach on a connection flight from Huntsville Alabama I just left a fucking literally just left a trailer and I'm sitting here my check ain't even cleared from Interscope <laughs> yet dude you know what I'm saying I, I'm still borrowing money for fucking Christmas and this, you know because the deal wasn't done yet yeah with Marshall it got done with Interscope but they were trying to make that marriage happen with Shady and so it, it was all on the it was all on the table. It was right there. What's gonna happen? And when I heard him uh, recite that, I was just floored, man. 
that someone of that caliber would take the time to remember. Or, or you know what? Knowing him, he probably just listened to it once. <laughs> <laughs> For real. When was the moment that you really knew you had it? Like you had made it? Like you knew that the shit was gonna work yeah, out. I went to Walmart with ten grand. <laughs> so I had like eight cards and I rolled up to the counter. And my ex girlfriend girlfriend from way before then was working and I was like, oh you what? Shit. At the counter? Yeah, I'm about to stunt. <laughs> Swipe the card, declined. <laughs> the check hadn't cleared yet. I wanna know, did you run into that girl? afterwards because i know you went back to walmart to try to you know stun on her the next day after check cleared have Man. you talked to her since nah nah <laughs> there's a there's been i'll tell you one story relatable to that though is uh uh in ninth grade i was called well in ninth grade there was a talent show at Southside high school in alabama and this is a 98 point five percent white redneck backwoods ass <laughs> high school in south side alabama matter of fact the only black person there corey was my homie <laughs> and uh i had just moved there from atlanta and i had brought all this hip-hop with me you know i'm skating and shit and i just got thrown into the fucking sticks Back with my grandmama in Southside Alabama, I was like, man, you know, I'm sick of this shit. I'm gonna fucking, I'm gonna freestyle. I'm gonna, I'm gonna spit at their talent show. I'm gonna show these motherfuckers who I am, you know. <laughs> and uh, I took a Crooklyn Dodgers tape, and I took an instrumental on a Crooklyn, Crooklyn Dodgers instrumental, and I put it on a boombox. And I walked into that gymnasium with a fucking high school packed in that gymnasium. And I put the microphone up to the boombox, fucking feedback. I mean, just hit play on the instrumental and, and recited this written rap, you know, specifically targeted to haters in the school. One of those dudes specifically that was like threatening me, putting shit in my locker, like, I mean, it was a real fucked up, like, dropping in bombs with the hard R. I heard that every fucking day, you know? Like, it was like that, you know? And um, one of them specifically stood up and threw something at me during that performance. And I always hated this motherfucker. I hated this dude. And he was this short, stocky, cocky little fucking jock punk bitch you, you know what i mean names? like huh you want to throw out names i wish i if i had his name <laughs> if i knew this dude's name i would say it he would have been on bloody fully Sunday. pronounce it but i don't know uh his name um but okay fact, the, the story being i'm recording um uh love story I'm in Black, Blackbird Studios, and outside of Blackbird Studios, there's a strip that runs in and out of downtown Nashville. And I'll go out and write in my truck, I'll be walking around a parking lot or whatever, and I had, sometimes I'll skate, and I was skating to the store. Skating down the street, brrr, this fucking car screeches, screeches on its brakes. I knew immediately that it was a fan. I, it had gotten to that point already. I could kind of I get the energy. I know somebody's about to hop yeah. out on me and do something or say something or want a photo or some shit. This dude hop, hops out. Yo, 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 wolf. Turn around and it's that motherfucker. <laughs> it's that motherfucker that threw something at me. And... I immediately go into fight mode. Like, I, my chin goes up. I'm like, what up? I, like, I'm thinking it's going down. He's like, dude. His eyes welped up. He started crying. He's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, dude. I'm so sorry for what I did to you. I'm so sorry. And I was like, that's cool. That's cool. 
It's all good, man. <laughs> that is there. I was like, I, I was like, yeah, you know, I, you probably thought about it more than I did. You know, <laughs> like just. It was poetic justice at its finest, man. That's how you turn a hater into a believer. A grown man crying. Oh, he was crying <laughs> like a bitch. Uh, one of the most debated hip hop songs uh, of the last 10 years, in my, in my opinion, one of the best hip hop songs because everyone came with their best verses, ASAP Rocky's One Train. Besides yourself, who has the best verse on that song? Uh... I thought Big Crit had the best. That was the best Big Crit verse. And uh, he remains my fave. But I still think I smoked everybody. You, you killed that. You have every, <laughs> Everybody killed their verse. Like, I, I don't know, man. What I, order did you get the verses? Like when you heard the beat, though, how many of the verses were on there? None. No, he didn't say, he just sent me the instrumental. I didn't hear anybody's verse. Wow. Did you, do you think he sent it out to everybody? Separate? I hope so. <laughs> I would hate to think that some of them, like, that was the best that they could come with hearing everybody else's verse. Um, and then, and then, I'm yeah. glad I didn't hear anybody else's verse, like, because maybe it wouldn't have drawn yeah. out that kind of emotion, that kind of, those kind of okay. bars. But yeah, I was hot that day. Like, that, um, yeah, I had some, I had some good lines on that one. It's funny, like, ASAP. I'm really thankful for that crew, man. The ASAP family has always been super, super cool and loyal, man. Like when, when I was overseas in Europe touring with Rocky, and or even if we crossed paths, I would be doing a show. If Rocky was doing a show in the same city, he would bring the whole crew, and they would jump in the pit like randomly, yeah. just come kick it, come to the shows, and um, for him to think of me, you know, like. And hip hop, man, you know, is for this because I've been genres. People forget that I'm an MC, and they forget yeah. that I can go there, and I enjoy going there, and I enjoy when artists or other rappers give me the opportunity. Cause as I serenade the swamp with bones and a foot stomp to gators and moccasins, cattails and black water reflecting my thoughts in the wind, realizing I'm a chief reincarnated, a war veteran. All right, well, last question to close off. Since we're speaking about verses. Um, you mentioned that the most important verse in your career was the one that you wrote on a Waffle House napkin and rapped to L.A. Reid. Do you remember the exact bar that made L.A. tear up? Um, no, I, I, I don't remember what I said. I know that I, I don't remember bar for bar what I said, but it was something to the effect of going home after that last meeting you know for christmas and not eating you know that me turning down his opportunity the last time i was there it left me you know broken why was that so know? important for you and like how you know you took a stand pretty early on in your career when you you had that opportunity there why was it so important for you to stay true to who you were and, and not rap in front of them. Because the story to me is the most important part. I don't want nobody in the industry or anyone on the streets to ever say that I didn't stand my ground. Well, it doesn't matter if it happens in a building 40 stories up in fucking Manhattan or if it happens on the corner somewhere in Alabama, you know, it doesn't matter where it happens, doesn't matter what happens at that moment when you're given the opportunity to stand up and do what's right for you, that's what matters. And I, I had already rapped in front of people in their offices before. That shit never got me no record deal. Yeah. I was perform. it was a Thursday. I was performing the next day, a Friday at a sold out show at the Fillmore, opening up for Raekwon. If anybody in that building or L.A. Reid wanted to see me perform, they could come to that show. Yeah. I wasn't about to rap in their office. Yeah. Are we doing the deal or not? No, we're not doing the deal. All right, peace. And then get in the elevator and almost get killed by my manager, <laughs> Kawan <laughs> Prather Bear. <laughs> you fucking idiot! <laughs> and then uh, I remember nudging 
KP, when we got in the cab, I was like, man, have you even thought about playing this for Eminem? And he was like, you're unbelievable, Wolf. And, well, rest is history.